No, we were talking about after film school, which is uh, yeah. you're living it, man. I don't know about that, but well, you're you're you stayed in L.A. You went to film school and you you figure out how to stay in L.A. and continue doing what you know what you wanted to do and and beyond, right? And that you're directing too. Now. That is true. Um, I think honestly, I was very green coming to AFI. Producing that track was the only track that made sense with my sort of background. What was and your all the other uh, well, I worked in finance. My my okay. undergrad was in theology, and then I went and worked in finance. And then I had a YouTube channel where a video went viral and ended up on a film set. And so that producer convinced me to go to grad school yeah, for film because I was going to go to NYU to do politics, uh -huh. which would have been bizarre timing, twenty fifteen ish oh, yeah. for politics. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. You, you so you were early on YouTube and you had a, a viral video go. Yeah, so when, I don't know if you I don't know if you were there for this, but when AFI did that thing at the beginning where everyone played like a little clip from their their yeah. past, yeah, real day. And I'm watching I'm watching all of these unbelievable clips. I'm like, oh my god, what have I done? Because I put like a 45 second clip of me doing a prank, a YouTube prank, and I'm like, I'm fucked, I'm fucked. I'm gonna day one, everyone's gonna think I'm a complete, you know, because AFI is quite, you know, it's renowned. They're, they're serious a, filmmakers. They're they're, they're serious, very serious. They're artists, serious people. But actually, after an hour of like very, very like incredibly beautiful, but quite sort of sad and often melancholic film, this one little prank video, I think, was was welcomed because it was a little bit of a, a bit of levity. I remember Maddie Cruz just like crying with laughter. I was like, all right, well, at least I got one person on my side. <laughs> <laughs> that, Maddie's a good one to get on your side, right? That's a well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah. you're right. Because that's like an eight to 12 hour day of watching everyone's work. I remember because I used to be like the MC person of that. And uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of very serious, heavy stuff. So you always needed those, those little palate cleanser, fun ones. There you go. Yeah. So, palate cleanser know, is the word, I think. You didn't know, but that's why you did really well. So wait, so did, were you, did, did you become famous? Like when you, not, not at AFI, for one, but. For one day we were on Good Morning America. That was actually the clip I showed was the Good Morning America clip. Um, and we were on today and I was doing my exams in London. So they invited us to come on the show, but I, I would have had to basically like flunk my exams. So I didn't. Um, yeah. So, and then what happened was, which is, I find this interesting as like a broader thing with filmmakers and everybody in the whole world. All of it is got like 300 views, 400 views. We were like famous on, on our campus. And then we always showed this video would get millions. And then it did. And we were paralyzed. We only released one more video after that because the other two guys in our little trio, and me to, to an extent too, I won't put it all on them, were like terrified the next video had to be better than the previous one. Right. And I feel like that's a film thing, right? You can make go make, I don't know, Alien, like Ridley Scott did, and then he suddenly has to like beat that. You know, yeah. and I think everybody, every movie he's done since is like, well, it's not Alien or it's not Gladiator. I'm not trying to pick on Ridley, he's a great filmmaker, but I'm just right. saying, I think that's a lot of pressure. To, to to emulate that i mean even jordan peele get out was so good that bar was set so high yeah that's kind of that's a tough it's a tough feeling i think but you also you feel it you feel when you watch their next movies you know and you would probably feel it if you saw your next videos you feel them chasing it right in that there's a similarity to it and then sometimes they get it out of their system and then they change what they're doing but um, right yeah i mean like like you wanted to do it but you were frozen with what do we do yeah and yeah. honestly, if we just had been been a little braver and just put all our videos on the thing, we probably would have just slowly become a. I'd probably be like a YouTube millionaire right now. I'd, I'd be I'd be Logan Paul and I'd be selling like Monster Energy drinks wherever he does. You'd be fighting, yeah, some uh, uh, other MMA guys and uh, exactly. Yeah, he's done all right. Well, there, then also there were those uh, who were the famous pranksters that started on YouTube that had their own show. Um. Uh, oh. I should know this. I, it's like um, three guys. What, it's it's like what you were doing, but they're, they're it's a what, prank show. Are they the guys who just they were the, they weren't like um they weren't writers at SNL or anything, were they? they no, no, not those no, guys. No, no, no. They're literally okay. they're doing um they do prank videos, uh prank, prank, yeah, prank. They're on show on YouTube. Prank guys. There's gonna, gonna be a lot. Of people. This is all gonna be edited, so don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This will be for. Not uh, this will be for Renee. It's definitely a tr out. prank trio. This is a prank trio, is it? What are they call TV show? Uh, dude, they're everywhere. Anyway, <laughs> you're not talking about impractical oh, impractical jokers. jokers. Impractical okay, jokers. Impract absolutely. 
Yes. Those guys were our heroes, 100%. Oh, yeah. so they were already doing it when you were... They were already... They just... Uh, yeah, they just... Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And did you do um, a real prank or did you do a staged prank? All real. It's funny you say that. I was about to say, this was the era where like... It's going to sound ridiculous me saying this. This is when the prank... This was the golden era of pranking where everything was real. And then what happened was because of all the kind of the competition of pranks and having to do like an even more in- insane one, then people started staging them. So they could do like insane things, which were basically just criminal, to be honest with you. Um, and they weren't fun. Like no one's having fun. People are like, th- people being chased with this, like a, a, I don't know, chainsaw. That's not fun. That's just like really scary. Our videos were very like family friendly. It's a Star Wars related prank as well. It's really simple. It's, we're in an elevator. This is the one that went viral. We're in an elevator. I don't know if you've ever done this as a kid. You press the button and they would open the door again and obviously wind up all the adults. So we were those kids. I would go inside. I wore like a sort of hood thing. And I would just do this with my hands and my buddy out, my buddy outside would press the button at the right time and the door would open. And that was the entire thing. And the camera was right in front of the lift. No one saw it. And everyone was just looking it's like a, mad, a magician. They just see me with my hands. They don't yeah. stick their head out to see a guy and the reactions were, that's the funny part. It's not even the prank. It's the reaction. Yeah, you're right. You're like, right. Cause they couldn't believe it. They couldn't understand. Prank. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. like when you see people react to magic, that's the joy of magic. Right. Agreed. Yeah. And that That's was it. so funny that <laughs> that was the prank because I still do when I walk into a grocery store, you know, and it's like automatic. I always do that. I go, you know, oh yeah, well, well, exactly. Everyone's done it, so I think that helped yeah. too. Everybody's done that, uh, <laughs> and it, it took. We would do. We would spend days planning pranks. We'd do hours and hours, and it would go nowhere. This one we did in twenty minutes. We had a different idea where I was going to be a zombie that would come out and run at people, which is mean. And mm-hmm. I was like, why don't we just do the door thing? He's like, that's not going to work. I'm like, let's just do it. Did it in twenty minutes. Went and had a pint upstairs edited it in like an hour put it on youtube went to bed like a few days later um when we uploaded it and i woke up to like half a million views from like nothing the day, night before it was crazy it That's was crazy crazy and what did it get up to like uh let's see uh star, star wars elevator prank <laughs> um it's at uh four and a half million Oh my god! The coolest That's thing like, that happened, yeah, was sorry, was Star Wars's official Twitter page tweeted it. <laughs> that was the coolest thing. That's the biggest. That's the cool. That's the endorsement, man. I honestly cool. couldn't believe it. Yeah. Anyway, that's so great, man. I love it, and that's so like out of the movies too. You know, like when the the young band has their their hit single on the radio, and they're like, "What?" Like that overnight success thing. So. So you were doing all the filmmaking things. You were like shooting it and editing it and all that. I was, I was more, I wasn't, I was filming it, but I was never, the editor was another guy who, it was three of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was more of the, I was more the prank, uh, prankster, I guess. I was more in the videos doing the stuff. I was the guy in the left. So were I'm you, like, yeah, gone. Was it ever a, a thing that you were going to like go into acting, be in front of a camera? So actually, since I got my green card last, not last Halloween, Halloween before, I have been doing a bit of acting. So I've done a few short films. I just did another feature last summer that I was actually one of the leads in. So I have done a lot more. I get, I, I always enjoyed doing the pranks so much. And, and obviously it's not acting in a very traditional sense, but there is a lot of, there is an element of it of acting for sure. Yeah. So um, well, I it's, really it's, a, it's almost a higher level of difficulty because you have to stay in character in front of people that are not actors, you know? That's true. Uh, I remember, I, I don't remember. I won't tell you this. It's the, I don't want this one on the podcast. So I won't, I won't mention this prank. <laughs> <laughs> but uh i managed to prank oggy i pranked oggy he told i did we did a really really juvenile video and he's like there's no way i'd fall for that no way i'm like okay do you see the game last night oggy did you see it he's like oh yeah and so we talk about it for like 30 seconds and then i do the prank on him and the look he gives me of terror of what the prank is he, he 30 seconds later he fell for it so i it was that was that was that was quite vindicating because it, it it did show I can still I've got a pretty good poker face. You still got yeah yeah, you know. Um, doesn't help me in poker. We play poker every week. You should come by the way one week. Ryan and I host a poker game. Ryan's still oh, yeah. my roommate, my my common law husband. Ryan, I've Strange. heard about this. Yes, yes. You too, living in sin. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. No, I don't want to play with some guys that that are professional pranksters. <laughs> Take all my money. I mean, we never win. Ryan and I never win. I've never won it. <laughs> You're not that good of an actor. All right, so you're you're no. now finally embracing the acting side, but let's but let's go back to the filmmaking side. Yeah, sure. So, sure. what inspired go? You know, taking it seriously and going to like an MFA film program. 
Um, I always knew I wanted to move to the States. As I said, I was going to go to NYU for politics. This prank got me, uh, there was a producer who like knew my dad very, very vaguely. He saw it and I guess he recognized me. I don't know quite how. And so he's like, does your son do social media stuff? Like, is he a social media kind of person? And he said, yes, which is not true. Um, I met with the guy and he basically hired me as a social media guy on his film for free. But I got to fly to Canada, basically producer's assistant on a feature. It was an indie feature, probably like two mil in Canada. And I was the best month ever. I mean, I just, it's a starry eyed kid going there. You know what I mean? And right. he every day was like, don't go to do politics, do film, do film. And I was like, nah, I don't think so. And then I got back to England and I missed it so much. I called him. I was like, I think I'm going to do it. He's like, good. I already wrote your reference. Here's the five film schools you should apply to. And he just texted me like USC, AFI, UCLA, Columbia or something like that. Um, and that was it. And, and I looked into the programs and I realized actually I was not a very eligible person because of the way you need to have a reel, all this kind of thing. So AFI's producing program was definitely the most logical. And I, I don't know if you'd agree, but I feel like the interview for AFI's producing program is kind of the main thing. Would you, I don't know. It just feels like basically you have, well, back then it was Betsy and Neil and they'd basically like, can this person handle the stress of producing an AFI film? Yeah. That, that was always, that's always like the focus of that. Like, you know, are they going to crack? You know, are there any, <laughs> look for any kind of like mental, you know, instabilities. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they're hidden very well. Cause as you know, a lot of those people get through, um, but yeah, you're looking, you're, if yeah. you're at the level of your get to the interview, then you're good on paper, but now it's like, okay. it's personality right. and yeah, you know, sussing out your level of, can you, what can you handle? But, but, but as you know, that interview isn't, is not enough to, 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 to match, to mirror, to what the experience actually is. No, not at all. Um, and I was cycle one, week one. Oh my God. So I didn't, I didn't have any of the benefits of like, hey guys, what was that house you used last week for your film shoot or whatever? It was all very much, you know, and I had, a, I, had a, I don't know, I had a, not a tough team, but I had a very serious team as well. But I think that was good. I think I think I benefited. It behooved me. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that yeah. I always think that, I mean, I've always heard that, they choose the, the first, you know, productions to go out based on like, who do they trust the most, right? Who's not going to completely fail. Uh, so I, don't know. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if I believe that. I don't know. But, Maybe. Okay. <laughs> okay. But you did it. You survived. You survived the first one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, talk about, talk about coming to, to, to AFI. You had been to the States before or, or did you come to LA just uh, for AFI? Yeah. So I came out, I came out, I met up one of the prank, one of the other pranksters. They were called, we were called the Jester Lads. So one of the other jesters went to Tufts. So mm -hmm. I visited him in Tufts uh, the summer before. Okay. Um, and I also came out to LA, I think, to sort of scope out LA a few months before AFI. Right. Yeah. Which right, is so... impossible because you don't know what the hell you're doing. It's such a big city. I didn't have a car. And I was like, this sucks. Oh, right. You got a car right but, away, though, I assume. When I moved out properly, yeah. Pretty quickly. Yeah. 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 I don't know how they do it. More and more, though, the fellows don't have cars, you know, especially international fellows because of, uh, you know, Lyft and Uber is so prevalent, but still, yeah. I don't know, man. It's like, this is a city where just to be able to just jump in your car whenever you need to go somewhere. And especially when you're doing production and all that stuff. Anyway, I agreed. I agreed. Talk about being there. So you don't, you don't really have a film background, even though you worked on a, one film. Right. Um, yeah. and, but I'm just saying like, you, you know, like you were saying, you're sitting in that real day and you're watching, especially the cinematographer reels. And you're like, holy shit, the, you, why are you in film school? <laughs> These are like feature feature level, you know, quality. Yeah. Do you, do, talk about, was there any kind of imposter syndrome or did you feel, you know, what was going through your mind or your heart? Um, uh, um, honestly, 100% there was. Uh, I think I was lucky because on that the terrifying day where everybody has to team up, where well, yeah, I think you have like three or four days to team up. And everyone's sort of taking interviews and it's sort of like last person picked for the basketball team kind of terror. Um, I was really lucky because I teamed up. I think I was the second team to team up. Um, and I sort of didn't mess. I, I made, I try to make decisions. I guess it's kind of like how Mark Zuckerberg wears the same outfit over and over and over again to save himself stress. Mm -hmm. I do that. I, so I was like, I'm going to make this, these guys seem fine. This is team with these people. Great. Now I can at least get going on this thing. Oh, it's a one location movie. Great. You know what I mean? So I, I, mm -hmm. I think, and I also wasn't afraid to ask questions. Um, and I feel like some people at AFI were, especially if they had more experience because they felt like they were embarrassed to do so. Um, I leaned on Natalie and Betsy and everyone around me. And, and being the first week, people didn't really know what they 
have expectations for like what people would, what the roles were, how they were aligned, like assigned. So for example, I, I remember we had to do, um, for the permit, we had to go like talk to all the neighbors and the screenwriter came with me to do that. That never happened again. Like after a couple of weeks, screenwriter was like, hang on, we don't have to help with this crap. You know, so, so the team, my team was came together and everyone helped out because yeah. the lines hadn't been like, they, were, they, were, they weren't defined as to what your roles were. By the time you get to like cycle two, the producers are doing everything, right? Like everything that is re- related to production. Yeah. Um, I, I, it was all just moving so quickly. I didn't, I tried not to think about. Yeah. Um, That's the it, best way to deal with it though. Like the, the not yeah. being afraid to ask questions and you're right. The people that, that come in that think they know it all, they are just afraid to, to ask questions and then they end up, you know, failing in certain areas. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, so speaking of failure, like that's always the best way to learn, you know, I mean, mm, there's yeah. the experience is the experience, but learning from mistakes. So you remember like, what was the biggest mistake you made early on or one of your cycles? Oh boy. Um, well, I took on, I did five cycles. I think that was I... an error. <laughs> yeah. Um, Whoa. I'm trying to think. This Were they really asking you mistake. to take on additional ones or did you volunteer? I remember I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time for one of them. (laughs) Like I was in there like doing something else. And Natalie's talking to Gianna about like, she needs a direct, she needs a producer, she needs a producer. And she's like, well, who am I going to get? And then they look around the room and I'm there. I'm like, fuck. (laughs) And these, these girls worked, that is worked me. They worked me (laughs) immediately. That is so funny. (laughs) That was on another cycle. That was just, that just happened. And what am I going to do? Go call them like, actually I want to get off it. And you know what I mean? Um, I, I don't, I, I'm trying to think biggest mistakes. Um, was there any like big, honest, like, was there an intervention with Betsy or? A... Oh, no, that's true. Right. My psych, my second, my second cycle one that had an intervention with a, with a therapist. And that was a horrible situation where like half the team's on one side and the other half the team's on the other side of the room. And it's like, sort of like, it was awful. I, and oh. I just, and I, yeah, I'm not going to name any names. No, you don't have to, um, but, but what was the therapist's role? Like, like a mediator? Yeah, yeah. So try. Let's talk about all these issues, and um, and everyone on my side was just crying, and everyone on their side would. It felt like they were just like sort of very stony faced. Yeah. And I was just like, "What the hell's going on?" I need. To, I don't know how to. And I'm the producer on there. We had another producer as well. It was. Yeah. I, I. I mean, honestly, there's probably so many mistakes I made that I've repressed, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you, I feel like that's what a lot of people did. They were like, all right, that's done now. I can move on. I think I was too hard on people, actually. When Betsy gave me my report, she, I expect, if I'm going to, I don't know, I expect a lot from people, I guess. And that's, that's not fair, especially in cycle one, cycle two, when everyone's still learning. I think, and that probably pushed people away a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, certain producers in my, in my cohort. Um, and that would probably be the thing I would change. I would be less tough. Yeah. You know? On your, on that your, would be the, on because your other producers. Day, yeah. I, I yes, because at the end of the day, man, this is this is the whole the best thing about AFI is the network, right? Yeah. So those who went to AFI and were absolute nightmares and treated everyone like crap, fine, maybe they got their special extra thing on the day that they wanted, but at the end of the day, when they leave AFI, they don't have those relationships or as many of those relationships. Yeah. To me, I was like, I need to, I need to make sure that I and I'm really glad Betsy pointed that out because I'm like the main thing is the relationships, and I still talk to like twenty or thirty people from my cohort, which I think is pretty good. Yeah. And you're living with one, right? I'm living with one. The other one seemed to basically live here anyway. Who's that? Like Gio. Gio sleeps over here all the time. Oh, you know, really? Gio. Yeah, no, but like it's mostly just because there's a karaoke bar down the street and he's like, all right, it's 2 a.m. Let's just, we'll just stay here. That's so funny. Anyway. <laughs> I won't bring it up since, uh, yeah. since I know we work together. Okay, so what was, uh, what was a big thing that you learned, though, over that, that first year? as far as like you didn't know coming coming in whether it's technical um, whether it's about the job creative about yourself um i think well honestly just from, from the ground up everything to do with film production i knew none of it like when i say none of it absolutely none i didn't know anything i mean obviously i know you've got to eat food so you've got to get catering and all this kind of thing but i just didn't even i didn't even when i watched movies i didn't even think about like the different takes and how many takes they were going to be in how you know the, the, the what's the word um coverage and all these kind of things this is all i learned everything every single right. thing that happened was and, and that is how green i was i i was prob- possibly the greenest person must have been in the top five greenest people at film school at afi no doubt 
Um, and then specifically, again, asking for help, but also like people, are, people do the power of the phone call is something that I learned from AFI. People love to email, they love to text, very impersonal. It can, people can misinterpret it. If you ask for a favor over an email or text, people are not nearly as receptive. Mm. I found that I would call everybody. Other producers might not and do lots and lots of emails. But if I need something from a location, like we fucked up, we need an extra day, we need a different day, I call them and like, look, I'm really sorry, I made a mistake. I really appreciate it. That was always my, the power of the phone call. And actually my very first director at AFI, a guy called Greg, he, I was worried he was like, wasn't, because it was all about like what people, what the directors would say to the other directors about how good you were as a producer. And I was worried that he might think I sucked because I was my first time. And apparently if I heard from another one, he's like, he's always saying you're awesome. He's like, every time I walk past George, he's on the phone. That means he's doing a good job. And there is a producing joke. I remember at, the, at our graduation, Jason walks in like he's on the phone. Dude, I totally remember that. It was one of my favorite things that someone's did on the camera. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it it's a producer amazing. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, that's everyone. That's the cliche in everyone's mind. Producers on the phone. Doing but it, whatever. It, making it, deals. For a reason. It's a cliche for a reason. I think yeah. that's, yeah. But you're right. Like, look, ultimately a producer is, it's all about communication, right? And I think there's a lot of wisdom in what you said, like, especially nowadays when things can be misinterpreted and people are getting lazy with their written communication, a phone call, like a phone call is so much more efficient now. It used to be like, oh, an email is more efficient. A text is more efficient. But now a phone call is because you're doing back and forth emails, back and forth texts. They're not getting it. You're just like, pick up the phone and just talk. And it takes a couple minutes and then you're done. And you yeah. have all the nuance of your voice and inflection and all the things you can't put into a, into a text. Uh, that's so smart. I could, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, I'm all about the phone call. But it's so funny. Like, you know, that was when you went to school and now I, I look at the current generations and they're, they're even less, you know, into talking, you know, even to talking face to face. Um, I think, yeah. No, yeah. I've heard people literally say they get anxiety from phone calls. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I, and sometimes when the phone rings, I'm like, Oh God, who is it? Oh God, what's this number? I don't recognize. <laughs> so I get, I get it, yeah. but it's, you know, it's very powerful. So, yeah, I know. I, it's, it's like, I always think like you've, you've made it in life. If your phone rings and you don't even look at who's calling and you pick it up and answer, that means you've, you've yeah. like, you are at ease with everything. You have not screwed anyone over in your life. <laughs> you don't owe anyone anything. That's a really, that's the, that's what we should all aspire to be. That's, that's a really good point. That's a good <laughs> that point. That is enlightenment. Like, Did you even study that is, in theology? No, I should have. I mean, yeah. I mean, you're right. Do I owe money to this person calling? Is it my angry ex-girlfriend? Don't have to worry yeah. about any of that. Right. Um, I, the lawyer that Ryan and I use, it's when I call, whenever we speak on the phone, it sounds like to me, his legs are up on his desk and he's holding like a pina colada on a beach or something. That's just the way he sounds. He sounds so relaxed. It's unbelievable. It's the <laughs> and best. I aspire that's, for that. That's great. Yeah. I want to talk to this guy now. Yeah, I want to. I want to pick up pick up on his nuances. Uh, okay, so yeah. let's talk about you. Then you go on to the second year. At what point do you start thinking like, what is my life going to be after school, right? And what was um, your vision of it? I think I don't know how, who else you spoke to on this, but I think for the international fellows. So much of it was like the the focus is get the get the visa, you know. Because I know we've lot we've lost a lot of people in my cohort, other cohorts to basically not being able to stay, which sucks. Um, so I feel like that was just driven home by AFI, by everyone around us. You got to focus about like reverse engineering what you need for the visa, which meant like going to festivals with your film, getting news articles about your film, um, just trying to do every project you can and just get your hands in as many pots as possible, um, and just sort of focus on these things and that was honestly what I did so you know before I even thought about what I wanted to do I knew that I wanted to do more than produce Oggy was really kind he let me write my cycle three with him and then we wrote the thesis together wow. that was like my first step which was great and it kind of gave me a writing credit which was really cool yeah um and then I knew I knew I was just like let's just make stuff I mean I gotta just make things because that's all the only option to get this visa and that by that it was like, a, in a way, it was nice because it forced us to be in that position. So when Ryan and I graduated, we made our first feature. Granted, it only came out last week. So it took us five years after shooting it, which is a whole other story. Wait, but actually, we did it. We were like, like literally last week, like 
literally on Tuesday it came out, yeah. Less than a week ago. Well, congrats. Yeah. Thanks. But I mean, we did the whole thing way too rushed, made so many errors. Um, I'm really, I had the best time of my life. We did it in seven days. Um, it's a great, anyway, I don't want to get into this if it's not yeah, yeah, relevant, yeah. but, but, but like, I just think I was very much like, I'm very restless anyway. So like, I just got to make stuff. And, that, and so I didn't think about some sort of grand plan of like this, then that, and like, I'm going to make a perfect movie that's like 5 million or 10 million. And it's going to have these people. And I was like, no, no I just want to make things and yeah. I need to, or I'm not gonna be able to stay here. Yeah. So that was kind of my mentality. Um, it's smart. Yeah. It's smart. I, that's what yeah. I, look, I mean, like you can make the most amazing thesis film, uh, it, like short films launch careers, like, you know, what 0.01% of the time it's, it's, yeah. it, it's not what it used to be. I feel like that world. And uh, there's so much emphasis put on people's thesis films thinking that's the one thing that will, get you there but really it's a really about like just making something that's like a you know a feature film and i want to say like a real film but like a feature film and who cares right it, nobody's going to watch it anyway right <laughs> so i always say like people in hollywood they don't read and they don't they don't watch so yeah but if you put it out there and it's on imdb and if there's a you know press about it that you made a feature film they will talk to you and meet with you and then you make the next one and it's about I getting think you're absolutely right, mate. done fast that's which is you know what you yeah. did and I think, but well, we didn't get done. We got it shot fast. We got it we got shot fast, fast but, we, but you, we literally... you, you got it out of the way and then you went on to the next one. You learned but, from that, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> the next one only took three years. Um, but to your point, actually talking about the thesis, not being the be all and end all, I do feel like my director was one of the, he felt just like that. He's like, this is, yeah, it's going to be a big deal, whatever. First of all, we're making a sci-fi action comedy. So it's not going to be like a festival darling. Um, but he's, we were already but, talking about but, the feature version of it. But I will say, like, more commercial than most, uh, at least AFI thesis films, right? Absolutely. I mean, it, we just got our first paycheck from AFI because we've licensed it to, like, a few different sci-fi channels and stuff. That's just cool. really cool, because that never happens. Yeah, yeah. But exactly. Um, so, but he always had, like, the you know, it was like, could Dread Space become a feature? Um, and at the end of the day, it's just a, it's just a short film, man. It's not going to, like... You know, we shouldn't, this is great, but like, let's remember this is, if we put all our eggs in this basket and all our hopes and dreams in this basket, it's going to be, there's a recipe for being crushed. Yeah. And I think that made the stakes lower as well for making the thing. My second year was was just so chill because of that, because of these lower stakes. Although the project was extremely production heavy and stunts and VFX and all sorts of things, what all the collaborators were so relaxed. That's the main thing. The people yeah. are, are always going to be your biggest kind of thing to deal with i think yeah if you didn't have to deal with people it'd be much easier to make movies well okay okay tough people stress no you're right stress no people. i know what you mean i know what you mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But you made you made something that was fun though right yeah which I'm, I'm proud of i'm really proud of that film honestly i think it's so much fun we got like again funny enough ended up on youtube as a sci-fi channel called dust and it got like they keep it's annoying they keep deleting it and re-uploading it every year i don't know why they do this but the first like, time they uploaded it, it got like a million views. So, fuck. That's a pretty well-seen thesis film, you know, in my mind. Oh, um, my God, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. They don't get that yeah. kind of exposure. Well, you're not allowed to put it on YouTube anyway, so like, that that limits it usually. Right. But, but like, Ari right. Aster's movie is out there on so many different channels and has millions of views. But, like, that, and that's part of the reason he became, he was able to make features, yeah. you know? Right. Um, um, and it just seeing, like, some, like, comment, like, I'm a grandfather, this really makes me think of my son. I cried watching this. You're like, all right, I feel good. I yeah. can, I can probably just die happy now. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, talk about that. Talk about the, uh, you know, we make films for audiences, right? That's the whole reason mm -hmm. we do this. When you first started, well, you got that reaction when you put a, a viral prank video up. So is that when you first got hooked on it? And then talk about, you know, like, what it feels like to get like the comment you just said for something you created and, and something you co-wrote. I'm thinking, I've been thinking a lot about what I want out of the films in terms of reaction and what to, for me and everything like that. And one of my favorite filmmakers is a, is a guy called Mark Duplass. I'm sure you know the Duplass, the Duplass brothers. And there's all these different metrics for a successful movie, making millions of dollars, you know, having crazy stars, going to Sundance, whatever it might be. And he says his only metric now is making a movie that he would be proud to show his kids when they grow up. And I was like, dang, that's a pretty cool metric. Um, I think I can get behind that. 
And so, yeah, and I think I think when you try and make it for other reasons, you it loses its heart and soul. Um, I had another movie. So the movie, I, the, the, so I guess there's been two features that I've sort of done that have been my main focus since graduating. And the second one, that was an absolute, it was very chaotic. Let's just say that. It was made during COVID with my ex-partner. We broke up during the film, which made things very interesting. I'll just leave it at that. But it came out and one of the reviews basically said, this movie is extremely flawed, um, but it has this heart to it that a Hollywood film could never get. I was like, dang, that is the review I didn't know I wanted. And I think that's true. <laughs> and Ryan made, a, Ryan made a movie like that where it didn't get crazy critical reviews, but it has so much heart and I can feel that heart. Yeah. And there's something really cool about that, I think. Anyway. Oh, I, I'm with you, man. That That's special. And that's, you don't even know how to chase it, but that's the thing that you wanted. That's the reason that you keep making it, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you did, so we don't need to talk in detail about that experience, but that was something you directed, right? What? what? The, the, the one the, that I- The feature with your ex-partner? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So we're doing, we were in COVID, we were locked down in Florida. We were having a tough time and we're like, how should we distract ourselves? Well, we could have, you know, do the classic thing and have a baby to save a relationship, or we could make a movie. Thank you for uh, making the first a movie. One did that. Yeah, yeah, I didn't actually, we didn't really discuss, but it was felt like that. It did feel like yeah. that was the sort of, uh, <laughs> and yeah, so that one was 2020, I guess it was started, and then mm-hmm. it came out, and it's end of last year. So, so, but that was your first time directing, right? No, my first one was 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 the one I did right out of AFI with Ryan, the one in seven days. Oh. So, so what happened? So what happened was right out of AFI, um, Ryan tried to get this film off the ground and it, and basically it kept falling apart. And he, he has a relative whose company bought this factory in the Midwest that was completely abandoned. And I was like, dude, man, that's a cool location. Can we, uh, can we just ask maybe they can not shoot there until when they renovate it? Obviously no, but I, like, eh, I got this other project, fell through. And he's like, I'm gonna, call my, I'm gonna call my relative. Calls him, comes back in the room and goes, all right, they're gonna renovate in six weeks. I'm like, okay. Well, well, fuck then. He's like, no, no, I'm going to go downstairs now and I'm going to write a script and I'm going to deliver it to you in two days. I'm like, what the, what's it going to be about? He's like, it's going to be about an AI, 1980s AI. We'd watched like, ter- we'd watched like Terminator and Predator recently, I think. Uh, it's going to be about a 1980s AI and two bank robbers who uh, are on the run and they turn this AI back on when they're in the factory. I'm like, okay. And he's like, you go find a film crew. We can only afford like six people. And, and basically what happened was, so in the six week window of that phone call, we did four weeks of writing and prep. And then we went to Illinois and we shot the movie in seven days. Alessia from AFI was the DP. We had an AFI editor. We had a sound guy who did like my AFI films. We had a local guy who did like everything. Uh, and then two other people on the whole crew. And that was it. And we're in this factory and we shot it in like seven days. And oh, the other thing he said was, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna produce together. I'm gonna go write it right now. You're gonna direct it. I didn't even like pitch myself. Yeah, that's the director. part I'm curious about. How did that happen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, that's, that was that was an executive decision made by Ryan, the producer. He's like, "We're producing together. You're directing." I'm like, "I don't." I'm like, "Really?" He's like, "Yeah," because we can't we can't be fucking around with some other AFI director who's gonna be like, "Let me do a whole pitch deck. Let me like what you know do all this shit." You know, no, no. Seriously. I know exactly like, what you mean. It's yeah, it's not it's not gonna work. Every other AFI director is going to freak out that we have to shoot in four weeks' time. You won't. I'm like, well, I am actually. He's like. Okay, I'll go down. I'll see you later. I'm going to write it now. So I had to call up these people and be like, yeah, it's about AI. Like, can you send this to Scrim? Like, uh, in like two days, I can. <laughs> it was bizarre, but it was honestly crazy. That was the craziest four weeks ever. Well, six weeks ever. Okay, um, so I didn't, know, what, I didn't know about yeah. this. This is crazy. And it's, so, it's, it's the Mark Duplass model. He always says, like, look around you, look at the locations you have available to you and write something to that. And you did that. That's exactly what Ryan did. Ryan, was the, Ryan had been to the location once. And so he did that, but unfortunately he wrote interior warehouse for every single scene, even though all the scenes were different like locations. So when we got there, we're like, where in this giant warehouse? You know what I mean? So we had to like find, he would like describe the rooms as like interior warehouse room one or like interior warehouse, like engine room, but there'd be like six of the engine rooms. So Leslie and I had to like go around and like basically place all the different things to those locations. Cause we look at the script and we're like, and Les is like, I don't know how we're going to do this. And we had, to, had a whiteboard and we wrote all the different things down. And then we went around on this golf cart and we're like, this looks like it could be the location, right? The blocking would work. And then no one else knew where they were except us. So every time we went to these locations, Alessia had to go on one golf cart and me in the other. 
because we're the only ones who actually knew where the locations were. This thing is like, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of acres, not like tens of thousands of acres. It was enormous. And it's you a Mitsubishi your, car you had factory. your run of it? Like you were the, it's just like you yeah. oh my it's God. It's a Mitsubishi, amazing. an abandoned Mitsubishi car factory. So wow, everything was left. Mitsubishi laid off like 10,000 workers and they were like walked out by a security. People left all their personal belongings, like pictures of their loved ones. It looks, the production design was absolutely insane because it looked like how we wanted it to look, an abandoned factory. Um, nuts. And then all the equipment of like the things that make everything. Cars, like... And they had like 20 guys who were working there who were like, basically it's bought by another car company. And those guys were like, they're sort of setting it up, but they would, we never saw them. They were like, it's such a big place, but they turned the robots on for us and stuff like that, <laughs> um, which was cool. And we joked that um, this production designer was Mitz, short for Mit Mitsubishi. So we'd be like, oh, Mitz, Mitz did a great job here. Mitz. And eventually on our IMDb and on the credits, when it says production designer, we've got Mitz Bishi. So people oh, are like, that oh, is this Jap brilliant. I freaking You're like there's some Japanese production designer. <laughs> Who is this Japanese guy? <laughs> I, the movie's yeah. going to do really well. People are going to want to hire this person. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably the best part of the movie, honestly, because everything else was, it's very, it is very run and gun. And but the production design is fantastic. I, okay. So uh, it's called Project Dorothy. I'm looking at it on IMDb. Um, yeah, we, we haven't got the best rating yet. I'll be honest. Let's see. <laughs> well, I'm so excited to see it now. Just, I just love the story behind it. Okay, let me ask you this: Did Ryan actually finish a script in three days? Yeah. Wow, he did. That's amazing. Good for him. Um, and then I'm, I assume you both kept working on it, you know, up until shooting. Uh, yeah. Well, it was mostly producing. We did. I, I ended up coming in as a co-writer, and I rewrote the third draft, third third act. Mm -hmm. um but he's definitely the main his story by and everything like that um right. and and then we did it and then we we just got in po basically we had all these vfx i think we had like 300 400 vfx shots and we were trying to do it at the, the price point of the movie which was like we shot the whole thing for like 25 grand or something production oh. uh, yeah so That's the whole incredible. thing is, well yeah i mean it was seven people for seven days you don't have to you know yeah. everyone's getting i see i'm everything. looking at uh, indb it says uh ryan was the first ad so everybody was Ryan was the first CD and the scripty and the producer <laughs> and the UPM. He was a lot. That was, yeah. Anyway. Um, but yeah. Uh, and you yeah, had, a, and you, know, that, you had legit, I mean, Daniel Harris is a, is a well-known actress. So she's the, she's the AI, the voice of the AI. Oh, she's the voice. Okay. So she's not, she wasn't there. Yeah, um, no, she was not. And yeah. then you had Alicia. Was that Alicia's first movie? Yeah. A cinematographer. Yeah. Yeah. So, so talk um, about that, that learning curve of directing now um, in this like, you know, ticking clock oof. mode. Uh, I like called up, speaking of phone calls, I called up all the directors I knew and asked for that. Just try to give me all the tips you can. I wrote them on a note, notes on my phone, read some directing books. Um, we. What was a good, what was a get, really good piece of wisdom you got from someone? A little. Um don't cut don't cut the camera when you want to cut the camera cut like five seconds afterwards because those can be the best moments of an actor's performance yeah and or don't be afraid to use stuff before you've called action if the actor isn't like looking at the camera and clearly you know and so that was that was more of i guess an edit note but you needed to know that before going into the film so you didn't call cut too early and yeah. i do that all the time i kept doing that and the actors would sort of they would and then oftentimes they would then maybe like do something completely different because they knew they were given license to do that a lot of ad-libbing. Um, the actor who played Tim, who's the older guy, was, is a tough bastard. He, Ryan was scared of him the entire shoot, which was hilarious. And when we turned up on set, not even on set, we turned up at the Hotel Ramada next to the location where we stayed for like the two weeks, took over the whole place. They were like, what the hell's going on? Um, he sits us down in like the little lobby with the script. He's like, all right, we're going to rewrite this now. I'm like, that was terrifying. He's like, yeah, this dialogue doesn't make any sense. Because the guy was, his character was from Cincinnati, like a rough working class dude. Turns out Tim was a rough working class dude in Cincinnati. Mm. I wouldn't say this. I wouldn't say this. And so he, we went through every single line, crossed them out, changed the lines, did like a table read. It was invaluable. Yeah. Invaluable, that, that thing. And then these were the only three scripts that had all that. And we lost two of them. So there's just one script that was like our Bible that had the right lines by the end. Just dirty as hell. That was the script. Couldn't even afford copies, like a copy machine. Like, well, because we know because we'd written it all down on with you know what I mean. We'd have to, oh, we'd just, have to, we'd have to, oh like, you're just going off of like handwritten notes. Wow. Yeah, 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 
Yeah. So we were just, we had the physical scripts and we just crossed stuff out. Yeah. And, and then on the day they were like super responsible for, for their um, continuity because like we had like four looks for them and varying levels of blood and dirt. And like sometimes, and Ryan bless him was the AD, but also the scripty. But Ryan's not the guy for that. I love him, but he's, I mean, he's not a scripty. He's just not that guy. Well, he's do. Um, I don't want to say ADD, but he's, you know. He's just, you know, he's Ryan. I love him. He wants to do a little bit of everything. Yeah, you got to be so focused for yeah. scripty. Yeah. Uh, well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the best, but the most depressed, the lowest morale on the movie was we're doing the opening shot. There was this bag that in some scenes they had the bag, some scenes they didn't. That was the biggest continuity issue. Anyway, we get taking. I'm being a director about this one actually. I'm like, we're taking some time on it. Unless it's like, dude, what are we doing? I'm like, no, this is an opening shot. Anyway, they do this. They do this run. They kind of fall. They get picked up and they keep running. And we do it like a bunch of times. And I'm like, we get one that's fantastic in my mind. And I'm like, guys, we could do it a thousand more times. It'll never have been there. That was absolutely perfect. And everyone's like, thank you. And then Ryan goes, hey guys, we forgot the bag. <laughs> so. I've just said there's no way in a, we could do a thousand more takes and it could never be better. And then the actors obviously, like they're like, well, the, so we're, we're, it's going to be bad then. I'm like, ah, we can we can get it like good. And he's like, you just said there's no way it could be. The other thing that someone told me was always be affirmative. Like say really good, really good at the end of every take, and then go, but let's try this. Yeah. So I would say brilliant, which is a very British word. I've been told yeah, saying yeah, brilliant yeah. <laughs> every single take, almost I'd say it to the point where Tim again was like, this is ridiculous. I could go over there pull my pants down and pee on this bush on camera. And he'd tell me it was brilliant. Well, that's the other lesson so, you learn is like that every actor, there's a different communication style, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, I mean, wow. they were, they were, they were, they were really nice. I, with no shot list either. So unless I made everything up, every single scene made it up as we went. Was that because just lack of time? Yeah. yeah. Lack of time, but also actually it kind of made sense because there was so much, there's so much flexible. We were just being flexible throughout every element of it was, was flexible, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, again, I think I let kind of like the same way Ryan was like, we can't hire, get an AFI director cause they're going to freak out. There weren't very many AFI DPs who we felt would be able to do this. Oh yeah. And Ryan had worked with, he'd worked the lesser on, on her thesis, uh, well their thesis. And I, so that was, he's like, I think she can do it. Yeah. So. Oh, I'm yeah. excited to see it. I, I've always been just a fan of hers because I think she's just so cool and chill. She's um, extremely cool. It would have yeah. to be to be on that movie, I assume. Honestly, uh, yeah. She was, she just took, yeah. And she was, wouldn't, the one or two times where I got a little bit, tiny bit diva she's like, don't be a diva. She's very Russian, which helped. I think we needed a Russian. Oh yeah, they're set. just like direct and cold and like, they just say it how yeah. it is, which you, you need sometimes on a film. Yeah. Was there a moment, yeah. you know, making that where you were like, you said something to an actor that snapped? Was a moment where you were like, oh, I am a director. You were like, I got um, this. I think it was more, I, I felt more, more in the, honestly, with my collaboration with, with Alessi was, was what my favorite part was. I think visually, I feel pretty happy about the movie. Um, I think watching some of the playback, in like uh dailies i was like oh this is good i feel good about this mm -hmm. um I, yeah i mean i guess just keeping up with tim keeping up with tim this guy like, studied under meisner and stuff like that keeping up with him was made me feel that way there wasn't necessarily a particular moment where i felt like that yeah. um but yeah that's a really good question i felt more like that on the next film because i just felt like i'd had more time to it it felt i would i want to it's gonna this is like i don't want to sound like false modesty but even in, it's now, I would call myself a filmmaker more than a director. And I feel like that's a market class thing too. But what do you... I don't know. What's the I, difference I, I, in your mind? Um, well, in this, in this case, I was doing so many different roles. I wasn't just the director. So that's kind of the more sort of practical definition. But also just, I feel like this... Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm, I, I think the, the collaborative process is, is, the, is essential for me, at least. I'm never going to be the person who can be an auteur or any kind of way. So... I don't know. I just, and also I still produce and I write and I act. So more just generally speaking, I'm a filmmaker. I guess, I don't know if there's you like, any, you like doing it all. You like, you like doing, it I like doing it all. I'm happy to produce it all. I still do what they do, which is reverse engineer. The last film we did, we shot at this house. The next, the one in the middle, we shot at the house in Florida. You know, we, we found a forest nearby. We, we made forest scenes. Yeah. We found, you know what I mean? It's just all done like that model. Um, I like it. So are you are you yeah. and Ryan officially like partners? 
Everyone thinks we are, um, but we've only actually made one. Well, we've made one movie together, like like properly made it together. The one I recently did, he came on as a producer, mm. but like not he wasn't as involved. And then we have a third project that we're kind of both producing, but like we're very we're quite hands off in terms of we're not line producing it. You know what I mean? Right. Um, yeah. So he most of our both our projects have not been with each other. That's probably the easy way of putting it. Yeah. I think we um, live together. It's a lot. It'd be a lot to be working together all the time too. <laughs> I never knew how these like married couples, like my first job was with Kathy Kennedy and Frank Marshall and they're huge producers and they're married. And like, man, you guys need a break from each other. Come on. Uh, that's yeah. the joy of but, it. Right. Then you like, do your own thing. Um, I was going to say yeah. like you, going back to, you know, like when you became a director, like if you won over this guy, Tim, like Meisner trained actor and and then he's at by the end of that he's listening to you, taking direction from you, and respecting you. Then that you you have achieved directing. Yeah, I think I gave it back to him as almost as good as he gave it to me, which probably helped. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? We're that's probably tired, what he, he wanted. That's that's when he respects yeah. you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he knew I cared a lot. He knew I would give them if they wanted to do another take, and I even if we're in a rush, I'd give it to them. Um, I was just, I, I, the same way I'd ask questions at AFI, I didn't have any kind of, like, I'm better than you guys. I know what I'm talking about, blah, 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 blah. And if I really disagree with them, guys, guys, I hear what you're saying. Maybe we'll get, if we have time to get that version, let's do it. But I really feel like this is going to work better. I just, having seen all these, having seen the other footage and knowing the story, I think this will work better. And I'm like, okay, well, you're the director, you know the story, rather than, like, bulldozing them or anything like that. Yeah, um, making people feel heard. I mean, that's producing also, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you're right, coming with a producing background really helped me, I think. Oh, yeah. Honestly, yeah. Oh, cool. I'm so excited to see that movie. Um, wait, so when if people, because you do all these things now, you're an actor, you're a director, you're a producer, you're a writer. When people say you're at a dinner party or a cocktail party, someone says, hey, what do you do? Is it filmmaking? Uh, in all seriousness, Chris, the most recent thing I've been saying is Jack of all trades, master of none, which yeah. is kind of honestly yeah. how I feel. Yeah. Um, I would say a filmmaker and actor. That's kind of why I like the word filmmaker. Yeah. Because it, because it covers all of it. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you go out on auditions? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're like, yeah. you're, you're um, taking that part seriously, the acting part. I am. I need to take it more seriously. Um, my issue right now is finding, is balancing my time. Uh, the actual main income I make is from renting out my house for film shoots. So <laughs> that's whole, that's like hours of my day as well. You know, just running that side of things. Yeah. Um, so wait, so let's talk about that. The, the, the reality of like an independent of life. Yeah. filmmaker, you know, like how do you make a living out after film school? Um, well, I'm a jammy bastard, which in English just means lucky person. <laughs> um, what happened was, right, uh, so my grandpa in the UK is getting very old, so he gave some money to me and my brother. We both use it for down payments on houses. Okay. And then I immediately turned the house into the most like film-friendly, production-friendly place possible, listed it on these websites, and have just basically paid off the house and my life. Um, Ryan's also my tenant, so he calls me a slumlord. Um, so I've just, I, in the same no, way, reverse. I've heard him and, say that about you. It's funny. I, I bet, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> reverse engineered the whole thing so that like the house kind of pays for itself and i use it for film shoots of my own and have people come it's great i love it i meet reminds me of afi i meet all these people all the time oh it's so often I mean, become friends yeah, with. for you're a filmmaker now it's it, they're coming to you to network right and they're like yeah. oh you're also yeah. a producer you're also an actor i'm sure you've ended up in some of these projects 100 percent. and actually my most recent move was i stuck the afi diploma on the wall um and that night i'd say 60 percent of the time now people people go you went to afi so, Whoa! But let's. Yeah, I've never heard the actual physical diploma meaning something in yeah. the real world. So that's what you need to do. It's this niche group of people who actually, you know, filmmakers basically. Yeah. Um. So and I, yeah, it's really cool meeting with people and like it's not a bad gig being a location person because yeah, the house gets destroyed. I got nothing really valuable in my house to be honest. Uh, yeah. I'm accepting that. Uh. And yeah, I I don't mind it at all. Like you know, it's it's a lot of fun. Have you had um, AFI films there? Yep. <laughs> I had an AFI cycle last year. I'm actually going to try and get more AFI people because I know AFI. That mm -hmm. was great because they were so nice to me because they knew I was friends with Natalie. Oh, got, yeah. They, they, brought me, they brought me muffins. 
they like they were like very nice to me <laughs> it was great that is good it's like yeah. uh natalie's watching because i'm watching yeah wow yeah they'll be on their best behavior uh is yeah. there a, a afi friendly rate if someone was like bringing their yeah first of course in there? I'm, I'm, i mean yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. my okay, rates so are really low anyway but yeah i do an even lower rate for afi obviously yeah but that that's a smart i mean you're a, you're a smart producer but in that you know producing your life like you could have done a lot of things with like a you know a lump of money from your family but to do that it, it makes it you mix you know you can be sustainable in this city which isn't cheap um no. and in this industry right it's like you opened a business that is film related in a way where filmmakers come to you yeah i, I don't know i've never heard of that before and it's just so brilliant i'm using your I, word I think, brilliant there you go i i think location is clearly my is the buzzword for me because every single one of my movies has been built around that how can i use this location these things around me to make a movie and in the same way how can i use everything around me to make a living and uh but i i don't i, I hate to i just feel like i'm really lucky like not everyone can that's a really privileged thing to be able to do so no you know. sure sure but it, it it does um i'm just i just think it like it should open people's minds to like, there are other ways to do it. Everybody, you know, I'm dealing with all these yeah. people that are graduating right now. And they're like, I want to get the assistant job at the studio. And it's like, okay, there's only, there's a, this many, right. But be right. creative. There are other ways to that. There, there are no rules to this industry. We should say. One of my buddies recently. So I, I don't know if you've heard of peer space and gigster. These are like the main websites yeah, yeah. where I get yeah. rent. He is turning one of his rooms in his apartment, which he rents into a podcast studio. And he's going to rent them out on Gigster and Peer Space because of having seen me do this. I'm like, awesome. So you don't even have to own a place. Yep. You know, if it's low impact like that, that's totally That is so smart. Workable. You just need some sound insulation, a couple of these mics, and yeah. And yeah. They're, everybody's doing podcasts <laughs> as we yeah. are living uh, in one right now. <laughs> in one right now. <laughs> exactly. When, when, when I start doing one, that means everyone's done one. Uh, <laughs> so funny. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So what's the, like, what's the schedule? What's your like daily life or is it, I mean, I'm sure it's a little bit different every day, but how do you plan a day? Um, so I might have like two or three film rentals a week, possibly up to, you know, in terms of rentals of the house, there might just be a few hours. I, I can have as, as few as like two hours for like a pickup scene for a short film or a music video to like three or four days straight features or more. Um, and then all the rest of the time I am either, well, if I'm not, if I'm not in post production, then I go. I I can't work from home. I don't know how you feel about this. I go to the local coffee shop where they. I basically I basically budget myself like six dollars a day to buy teas yeah. as my we work, um, yeah. and I work there and I often meet people there and I'm writing, working on the the next project. Um, I've got to a point where the, the location stuff kind of pays for everything else. I live pretty frugally, but you know, obviously, hopefully, some of these movies start making money too, and then hopefully eventually i can wean off that stuff um and then right now i'm in post on a feature i'm in a weird place because we because of the holidays and the, the, me going away i went home and the editor went home so we've actually had a two-month break from editing mm -hmm. and i really need to like jump back in um, that was the feature i was in so yeah. it's very hard for me to be objective about it so i've really tried to get as much feedback as possible um and, but it's tricky also that because, one too yes but again yeah i did um i'm but i'm in the movie one thing that bothered one thing i was like you know what if, if someone else some actor is going to be if i'm going to be directing and not holding the camera i'm going to go nuts because i'm gonna be like oh my god he's not doing the found it's a, oh sorry it's a found footage movie oh. so it's a found footage movie so the okay. so the the lead actors the two of us are the two camera people i'm probably doing it more than the other person so i knew what i wanted right and then i got derek matarangas afi AF, great oh. afi guy he's on monitor and i'm like dude you are the visual guardian of this movie i can't be watching monitor i want to be acting Tell me where it's gone wrong. We can shot list it, whatever. But like, you, you know, did we get what we needed? Do we, do we have everything? And honestly, found footage, it, I, I got in, I watched a few recently before, well, before what, making, writing this script. It was written as a normal conventional movie. Watched some found footage and it was like, I think this could work as found footage. So I rewrote the whole script for found footage. Hmm. Um, you can steal like crazy. I'm not going to say the AFI, sorry, not AFI. We didn't steal at AFI. I'm not going to say the LA locations that we stole at, but boy. I don't know how much you have to pay for these. Um, well, look, that's what you have and, to do on, on, on these low budget movies. You have to. Yeah. yeah. But for found footage, like no one's going to, we're not even going to get in. Like, it yeah. looks like we're just YouTubers. You could be on your are. phone our, and grab Our characters are YouTube. Yeah. Well, exactly. Our, 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 
our characters were YouTubers, but they have like a good enough channel where they have like a nice camera. So we actually had a proper camera we're shooting oh, on. Nice. And then the monster is a scarecrow. Because I feel like scarecrows haven't got any love in horror. You ever seen a scarecrow yeah. horror movie? No, but I like they get... scarecrow was a Batman villain, but like it's a great iconic, right. like, yeah, it, yeah, it should be. I'm so that's so, so cool. So my new thing is I'm trying to build, you're literally the first person I'm telling this to. I'm trying to build an independent horror franchise with a scarecrow monster. So I'm aiming as high as you possibly can, to be I honest. Love it. But that's my goal is to, to have a basically this character be fair, you know, become a uh, horror fans. They know this character. People dress up for Halloween. That would be a dream. Yeah. And there might be two, three, four of these movies. I, my character kind of gets killed off in the first movie. <laughs> So not much room for me, but you never know. I could come back in cool. one, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Your twin that we didn't so, know about in the first one. Yeah. Um, exactly. Well, and there's also like everybody comes in with like some form of knowledge of a scarecrow, which is nice, right? You don't have to like explain too much. You're like, oh, a scarecrow. There you go. Boom. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and it was just all my friends. Uh, we sh- I got a load. There's a quite a big cast because there's a whole cult that worships this scarecrow. So I cast like literally all my friends who, who are a bit... So they love it. They, you know what I mean. And it, yeah. all my friends who are on the film, it's just is this Ryan a lot of like out helping in, out in uh, farmland because of a scarecrow. It's all shot at my, nearly all shot at my house. I know it's going to sound crazy. Like, how is this possible? Yeah. Why is there a scarecrow in your house? I know you can't tell me everything, but the idea is, I won't. I'll tell you. Back in back in the nineteen, so until like nineteen forty five, the valley was still like seventy percent agricultural, That's and cool. even like into the sixties. Um, so this cult has been worshiping this scarecrow for uh, since the 1800s. We actually had a, uh, the very first scene of the movie was set in the 1800s. We didn't shoot it. We may shoot it. That's a, uh, one of the things we did mm. to decide. And whilst the city's grown up around this area, this is a fictional area of LA called Oak Bridge. Uh, they have con- retained control and they still worship this scarecrow, but it, but it essentially lives within now an urban area, but it's brought them a lot of prosperity and this kind of thing. And they just, they sacrifice people to the scarecrow. This scarecrow goes after people who are not uh, authentic. It goes after people who are fake. I was like, LA, perfect. <laughs> we've got these two, you, we've got these two YouTube, yeah. YouTube TikTok-y type people who are completely full of crap, particularly my character. Yeah. And the, it's all kind of controlled by this cult. They, they have the police in their pockets. They, like, can, do, you know, they can do what they want. Yeah. Um, and the scarecrow, they find the scarecrow in the backyard. And like, what the fuck is it? You know what I mean? What is? And then it, but it, it kind of, there's a sort of explanation as to why it's there and blah blah blah. The realtor's in on it. So I, I'm curious. No one, none of the feedbacks I've asked been like, why is there a scarecrow there? Mm-hmm. But I can see why you would think that immediately. Well, um, yeah, I'm sure when I watch it, it'll all make sense. But th- and then you explaining it, I'm like, that's a great, that's a great backstory. Also, I'm a Valley native, so I, I do know that background. Oh, I think a lot of people that's know, awesome. like. Well, a lot of people yeah. know Hollywood was like all, all orange groves, you know, back in the day. So exactly. That yeah. makes sense. So and I love the kind of like little Easter egg fun tie in that you were a YouTuber. Now you're yeah. playing a YouTuber again. There's like a little built in yeah. audience there. Like don't, don't discount yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so you had someone we'll playing see. a scarecrow like that's in shots and stuff. Yeah. So we had, we had, so the stunt, the main, the stunt coordinator on dread space, he's like a six foot four, big dude he's in the scarecrow outfit every time there wasn't a real stunt ryan scringe is our scarecrow <laughs> that way we didn't have to bring the stunt guy in just to basically you went from be a big dude double. to ryan scringe to ryan, no offense ryan, ryan, but... ryan, well ryan on tiptoes you know ah. kind of bag it out i think we like threw some pillows we also had a, like a man we had a mannequin alex oh alex dixon production designer my very first production designer on my cycle one week one was the production designer on this i love it and it, she's awesome she's awesome I love it. it shows that Sorry. you keep relationships, which is like a very key part of being a good producer. I try. I I I really struggle when I lose friends. I take it very personally. Yeah. So it's a it's a it's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> yeah. I feel the same. I'm always like, why doesn't that person like? What? And then you want to win them over. Yeah. Um, right. Dude, that's awesome. I I if you want to do like a, a test screening at AFI, let's do it. Really. Yeah, we'll get that oh, little theater and we'll we'll uh you know pack it full of some well you bring some 100%. people some people. Yeah. I would genuinely 100% be down for that. Thank you. Yeah. That, seriously. That sounds sounds that, awesome. That was you know you asked me earlier what the biggest thing I learned at AFI. I take it back what I said earlier about the phone calls although that is non that's a close second. Test screenings. 
Mm. The number of indie films I've kind of helped out on where they won't do a test screening. The, the excuse is then out of the money, time, resources. The real reason I'm convinced is they're terrified of feedback yeah. that will crush them. But then they're only going to get that feedback later when the movie's already done and released and it's too late. Yeah. I will I will take the brutal feedback, honestly. Yeah. Give it to me yeah. now. I will say that, that you know, it, that's one thing AFI gets right in that they prime you for that with narrative workshop, which is like getting used to listening to feedback on a finish on a quote finished film, right? A very yeah. quick, you know, scheduled finished film. And then they have you test your thesis. Uh, which yeah, it's always scary. Narrative workshop is emotional and like, you know, traumatizing. And then the test screening for your thesis, it, but but that it mimics the real world because they do do that. But it also it only helps your film if you listen to like a, a a note that's being or feedback that's being repeated, right? One hundred percent. I remember we did yeah. it for was it Ryan's first movie? I were you part of that one, the Alien comedy one? You, yeah, yeah, we did it for that one, and you actually got us the little AFI theater for this project, Project Dorothy, the one that you we just talked about, the sci-fi. Oh, that we did okay, I remember days. getting the film. Okay, I didn't know it was for that. Cool. Yeah, well, both. There was one for both. So yeah, I think but I got, remember we did went, the big theater for the for the. You alien. did the big. You did the big one for useless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I I went to that one. Um, that's cool. That's the one yeah. that I felt like had heart. Had heart. You know, it's a flawed movie, but it, you feel the fun and the joy and the heart of it. Yeah, you feel Ryan. Yeah, in that, totally. Honestly, and there was just yeah. like I just remember like everybody came out because they all liked you guys, and then it was like there was just, it was like a, yeah. I mean, obviously it wasn't perfect, and that was the whole point of it. You know, it was a rough just. It was, a, it was a rough cut, but it was there yeah. was so much love in that in that room and everybody wanting to help, like, try to, you know, make it better, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, that's cool. So l- last th- last couple of things, I'll, I'll, I'll ask it. Yeah. Do you have yeah. a mentor in your life that you that you found early on or at school that is still a big part of your success? Um, Even if it's Ryan. Because, so. <laughs> yeah i wouldn't give him that much credit, the pro- but. i'm gonna uh the producer who convinced me to come to la mm. definitely was my first but he's not he's a we as soon as i got here it felt like i drifted because he's a finance guy who funds movies doesn't really know much more than that not not, not that's, that's not what i mean like he's not he's not necessarily a creator creative yeah. per, as creative a person um i my, yeah ryan and my friends around me um Betsy, I gotta put up put up I think it's a collection of people. I don't I wish I could say I had one. I love Mark De Plas from a distance. Yeah. Um gotta give my old man credit. Like yeah. the way he operates, he's all about like work culture and keeping everyone happy. And that to me is really a good, valuable lesson that I've learned. Um yeah. My dad. My dad, Ryan. I feel like Chris, you 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 were an inspiration to all of us. You have a very well, I was talking about this to someone yesterday uh, at dinner. You, um, it's the attitude of um, not being phased by things that are outside of your control. Because the Jurassic World, for example, terrible, not the best movie ever made. There's a quote in it where the guy says, the key to a happy life is to accept you're never really in control. And I feel like you always were just like, just why are you worried about this? I don't know. Is that fair? That That's very fair. And I've, I've never really thought of that but like when you say it it's like so crystal clear that yeah i i i when i see it happen to other people i i try to like you know address it and be like like it's you're gonna everyone's gonna forget about it because a lot of times it's about like what do people think about me in this moment right and Mm, i i've i've always tried to remind myself they're gonna forget about this in 30 seconds in five minutes in 10 minutes you know and if you can go through your life like that, there's so much freedom in in being a little more authentic, you know, not not doing things to to try to you know impress people or make you know or to get people to like you. And I say that as someone that's always trying to like you know entertain people and get people to laugh. But I, I feel like th- it, that also comes from something else, which is also you know just I don't. I, to me, you know, I've I've always wanted to like you know make movies and everything, and I I do stuff on the side, but I've always done it at, uh, from a I've always thought like I found joy in it, right? And I and I yeah. I think most filmmakers do it because it's fun, right? It's like a the best excuse in the world to hang out with your friends, right? You know, and you're you're you are living it in the the most like in the most classic way, right? You're like that's you're the role model for that, 
And so when I see, right. especially like fellows and they're stressing out over thesis or the production office saying this and all the, all the, all the stuff is like crushing their soul. I'm like, why did you want to do this? It's supposed to be fun. And I, I, that's, that's the thing that I always try to like embody and, and inspire in people. So that, and what you said. So I thank you for that. Cause I never well, really thought. <laughs> well, I think the fact I, you're right, you are like that. And that was a nice juxtaposition from all of the stress of everything else at AFI. And I get it. We're spending a lot of money. There's a lot yeah. of, a lot of, it was, it was like being in high school. I went to an all boys school for high school. So <laughs> I felt like I went to a uh, mixed high school, like, you know, girls and boys high school at AFI. It was, there's a lot of, wah, 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 oh, a lot of yeah. chatting, a lot of like negativity. And I'm like, really? I don't know. And I think it was all blown up to be honest. Like, I think most people were like really kind and everything, but uh, yeah, we just let's have a good time. And that was, that yeah. mentality is what, what I felt like I had on my thesis which has made my year compared to so many other people so much more relaxed and it, and, and just fun. Fun yeah. is the word. Yeah. Movies should be fun. Yeah. The, making should them fun. should be fun. Watching them should be fun. It, it should all be fun. So like, let's yeah. just leave it with that message. It should let everybody have more fun. Uh, I'll ask you this just as last thing. How has it been yeah. cool to see that Augie, you know, having his first feature come out? hundred percent, hundred percent. I went to see it at AFI. Um, yeah. yeah, it was super exciting. Not just the fact that Augie was on it, but so many of my other close friends were on it too. Producing it, shooting it. Uh, um, yeah, I, I um, every time I hear that someone from our year or anyone I know, even vaguely, is making something or has made something, I am so excited to go see it. I, oh my goodness. And I do feel like that's one thing I give myself credit for. I think there's a secure, like a lack of insecurity in that. Because I think yeah. some people get insecure when they hear that someone's made something there's not a competition there's room for everybody um so let's all just rise together to be a cliche i guess but i just no, want to no, see but everyone it, there's else so much I think it's that. super people, exciting people compare and despair and they, they they see someone got success and they think like that was my shot you know and there are a million shots it, it's it's not a zero-sum game and I, I was just like try to force people to celebrate everyone else's success you know it's yeah. so i don't yeah. know why it's so hard for people but you know it, it doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't take away from what you're doing. I, I think we've never been in a, in a, we've never been in a time where comparison is more readily presented to us because of social media and everything like that. And like, you look at yeah. someone's Instagram and you're like, they look so happy. They might have, they might be depressed. They you could have all sorts of horrible things going on. They feel like they need to present themselves in a certain way. And then you hear, yeah. anyway, we can just get a whole other conversation. No, but, I know. Uh, I know. No, we're saying the same thing. Know. Yeah. But you're right. It is social yeah. media. Just, is you know is is gas on that fire so um yeah hey man this was awesome uh and i think we're just yeah, barely scratch the surface because the next time i want to hear all about the bo all boys school uh a lot of stories there i'm sure <laughs> oh my goodness yeah <laughs> or just make a horror film about it uh yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah. hit me up when you're when you're ready to um do a test screening because uh i'm definitely going to sit through that i want to watch it and i can't wait to see it and you're and but you must have turned a profit on this twenty five thousand dollar movie right Please tell me. Um, not yet. You will. I know. I I think we will on this one. I really do. Uh, it was twenty five thousand for production, so a lot more for post. Right. I'll say that. And then okay. Daniel Harris came in late as we had paid it. But I, you know, the money that we spent wasn't very was very much to lose to start with, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and I do think now a lot of these indie movies will make they kind of they might not break even for the first year or two, but they will break even, and they will then make money. You know what I mean? Like. That's what I, I've seen from people who might have released maybe a couple of years ago. And now the first time you see money, but you know what? That's awesome. That's an extra 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks a month to the, that they can use for paying their mortgage or whatever it might be. Yeah. So, you know. Cool, man. We'll keep making them. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, man. I'll talk to you soon. Maybe I'll see you at poker night. Oh, dude, every Tuesday. Every Tuesday here. Tuesday? Every Tuesday? Tuesday? Every single, we haven't missed one yet. Good group of people. A lot of film people. The people you probably actually there's not that many AFIs, so you actually won't have yeah. to like fill up with a bunch of you know AFI nonsense. What's the buy-in? Five bucks. Five oh, bucks really? buy-in. It's not we're not we're not elitist, man. That is like the AFI the nonprofit was... crap. There you go. And then we you can buy back in another five if you want to like you know if you, yeah. you want to go nuts and then you can buy back in again. All right, five bucks I can handle that yeah. and it'll it'll be practice because I it's haven't good... played in a while. So it's yeah, it's a good crowd. We'd love All to right, have man. you. I'm in. All right, bro. All right, cool. thanks, for, thanks for spending the time on this. This is fun. Thanks for having me, man.